Hi guys, I wanted to finish the discussion of chapter 2, which is the application layer, with an overview of peer-to-peer -peer applications. So I don't know how many of you remember Blockbuster video, but it used to be a thing before file sharing. Um, so peer-to-peer uh, -peer systems, um, such as, for example, BitTorrent that enabled peer-to-peer -to, -peer to a large extent, um, have some interesting characteristics. First, unlike the client-server architectures, which we have discussed, there is no centralized always-on server. Um, the different components of a peer-to-peer -peer systems communicate with each other, sometimes at random, sometimes according to some structure. And a nice thing is that these peers can be intermittently connected, meaning that not everybody has to be online at the same time for the system to continue working. Um, clients can change IP addresses, connect, disconnect. It's got a, sort of an ad hoc um, membership and the system itself as a whole continues to exist, continues to move forward as long as at least there is some continual set of nodes that can um, kind of maintain its shared state. Um, generally, we, we divide peer-to-peer -peer systems into unstructured peer-to-peer -peer systems such as BitTorrent, Tor, and blockchains, even though blockchains are pretty complex and they're a bit of a hybrid, um, and structured peer-to-peers, which are basically distributed hash tables and kind of various systems built on top of them. Um, so what kind of peer-to-peer -peer systems um, can you think of that are in use today? Um, like specific systems, specific applications, maybe let's discuss this in our discussion group. All right. So the first thing that makes peer-to-peer -peer systems really cool is the fact that they can scale very well. Um, there's downsides to peer-to-peer -to -peer systems because they're a little bit more complex to run and they're decentralized and so they come with all kinds of headaches, but um, they do have this self-scaling property, which is very, very cool. So if we look at a client-server architecture, what we have is a bunch of clients connected to a server, maybe downloading some files. Okay, and then you can look at the upload rate of um, the server, u sub s, and the client download rates. And so then you can characterize the download speed or the time it takes to um, distribute a file from that server as the max of the ability of the server to upload data to the n clients. Um, and um, so I should just mention that we have n clients and a file of size f. Okay, so we have how long it takes for the server to upload data to n clients, and um, also the minimum time, or the, I guess the time to takes to download a serve uh, the file from the server by the slowest client. Okay, so the time to upload a file is basically either this or that. So the max of those. Okay, but assuming we don't have a particularly slow client, the time to distribute this file is limited by um, the upload speed of the server. Now, when it comes to peer-to-peer -peer systems, the difference is that clients can also upload data to each other. So we have a server from which clients can start drawing the file, but then once the file or part of it exists on one client, that client can start sending it to another client over the internet. So if you look at the formula for that, we have um, the time to upload a file to one client from the server, okay, the minimum time it takes for some client to download the file from anybody, and then the time to distribute the file to n clients is the upload speed of the server plus the upload rates of the different clients. Okay, so you can see if this was the bottleneck before, now you can see that this could be the bottleneck or govern the uh, speed of the system at scale, which basically allows you to add the resources of the server and the resources of the client. So now the more clients there are, the more resources there are in the system, which is the cool thing about peer-to-peer. -peer. Okay. We can also look at the time it actually takes to upload a server, uh, a client, uh, upload a file to um, a number of clients. Okay, so here we have um, the formula for the distribution time of the server, okay, which basically as the number of client grows, so does the time of distribution, right? Because this n becomes larger and larger, nothing, has, nothing else changes, so eventually this term begins to govern the speed of the system. While on a peer-to-peer -peer system, um, 
we have basically this. And so as we have additional clients, okay, we have additional upload resources. And if you look at the, if you kind of set up the system in a way that um, you have uh, the time to upload a file on some one client is one hour, then eventually distribution time will basically start approaching one hour for this peer-to-peer -peer system, okay? So this shows that these systems are self-scaling in that the more clients you have downloading file, the more clients you have uploading the file. So that's a very cool property. Okay, so this basically describes the performance characteristics of BitTorrent. Um, and so BitTorrent is a very cool system. Um, it was basically designed to deal with very popular files. There was this problem that if a file is really popular, everyone tried to get it from one server, and then that server would not have enough bandwidth. And so um, BitTorrent came, um, came around. I actually know a guy who lives in Bozeman that kind of developed BitTorrent commercially and made a whole bunch of money on it um, even before um, BitTorrent was sort of available to the public. So pretty cool stuff. Um, and so it deals with flash crowds where, for example, there used to be a thing called the slash dot effect when if your website made it onto the slash dot news site, um, everybody would go to it and basically crash your servers. So to this day, we call it a slash dot effect, though I don't think that term is popular anymore, but you might still hear it. Okay, so the way BitTorrent works is you take a file and you divide it into some chunks and then clients, let's wait for this to start, right, start downloading the file from the server and sort of add um, a chunk to their storage and now they can send that chunk to somebody else in the network. So this becomes a collaborative download and even though BitTorrent has been used for much piracy, it does have some real publishers, um, so it is kind of difficult to block legally um, in mass. Okay. So to publish a file into the system, you need to run a tracker, which is a server or a service um, that kind of keeps track of who in this network, what nodes in this network have some of the file or all of the file chunks. Um, the search for those trackers out of band, meaning that you need kind of a separate website or some separate system to, to, to find that tracker in the first place. Pirate Bay comes to mind, um, but there are other kind of systems as well. And then to join this network, you contact the tracker, you get some IDs, some IP addresses of the peers that have data, and then you contact them directly to start downloading um, data from them. Okay, so let's look at this mechanism in a little more detail. Um, first question is which chunks to download. If you divide a file into different, uh, different chunks, right, here's kind of a, a, a graphic of the chunks that some peer has downloaded already in the blue and the stuff it's still missing kind of in the gray. Okay, so the question is, if this client connects to a swarm um, of nodes, which chunks, which chunks should they ask for first? And the strategy, which is pretty clever, is to ask for the rarest one first. So a client can look at all the chunks of data that these clients have, figure out which chunk is least represented and download that, thereby creating a copy of it that's available for others. So. This mechanism basically equalizes the number of copies of each chunk in the collaborative download system. The other question is which peers to download from. From a tracker, you might get a thousand peers that have the data, but it's not clear which of them you should connect to. So what you basically end up doing is connecting to some of them and then start downloading the file. And then those files basically those peers ask you to upload some of the data back right this could be the case that you have 37 percent of data someone else has 23 percent of data and so you guys are basically sending data back and forth to each other right and from the point of view of this peer if you are uploading data uh, at a high rate they're going to let you download data at a high rate okay so if you have a good relationship and by that I mean a good connection through the network, you can transfer files uh, or chunks pretty effectively. If on the other hand you're connecting to some other peer that may be very far, you are just as willing to upload data to them but the network is slow and so they say, you know, they think either you're far or you're not willing to upload and so they're going to let you um, download less data from them. And so through this mechanism, 
um, just by kind of this tit for tat sharing strategy where if I get data from you, I give you data from me, um, you end up kind of reinforcing connections to good clients and abandoning connections with bad clients or slow clients. Um, so everybody kind of um, is able to connect to the best set of clients that they have access to. Now, the other question is how to even start downloading this, um, this file, right? So if you have nothing to upload, people are not going to let you download anything necessarily unless they're altruistic like this um, guy here. Okay, so what even someone who has all the data, what they will do is they will periodically ask you to upload something to them just to measure how willing you are or how fast your network is to do it. And even if they have everything, but they see that you're uploading to them, they will allow you to send, uh, to download data from them at a high rate, okay? Um, this mechanism can also be probed to use for probing to see if new clients are um, better, if you should switch from a well-connected, from a client that you're already connected to, to another client. Um, and it allows new nodes to get something, right? So through this opportunistic at choking, I'm choking, this seed will send you something and then ask for it back. But because now you got something, now you can start uploading that something to other people to kind of um, unlock their willingness to share data with you. Okay, um, another question for you guys is what are some limitations to BitTorrent scalability? What do you think could be uh, preventing the system from working as described, from working well, um, based on, for example, uh, your knowledge of how networks are laid out and um, ISPs connect with each other. All right, the next system I want to discuss is Tor or the Onion Router. And it was actually developed by um, US Navy to support um, privacy preserving or secret communications kind of in the spy world. And then uh, non-spy started using it, creating uh, lots of headaches for uh, governments that may want to track them or track their communications. Okay? And so the idea there is to basically send encrypted data through the internet in a way that prevents people from figuring out that it is you who is sending that data. So the mechanism for this is as follows. We have some sort of peers that are participating in, um, in the Tor network. And so Alice, who wants to send some message to Bob, is going to um, obtain a set of SSH keys um, via some path through this network. Alice can decide what that path is or it can be selected randomly. Um, in any ways, it's somehow randomized um, at the end. So Alice obtains the public keys uh, for all these different nodes. And so Alice's message is first encrypted with um, the key of the last node here, C, then with the key of B, and then with the key of A, okay? And this is the bundle that gets sent into this network. <clears throat> now, when A or this node gets, the, gets this bundle, it is able to decrypt kind of the inner part of it by taking out a layer of encryption using its private key. And then it also knows there's, there's some, a little bit of data in there to tell it where to send it to. Okay, um, now this node knows that the message came from uh, Alice just because they have a direct connection to this, to this node, but they not necessarily know that the Alice is the sender, it could also be that Alice is actually just doing forwarding on behalf of somebody else. I'll come back to it in a second. So A gets this bundle, decrypts the outer layer and forwards the inner layer to B, and now B can decrypt part of it and then send it to uh, C and then C can decrypt the rest of it and forward the message in clear text at this point to some internet server, right? So for example, someone in North Korea could be using it to access, um, I don't know, CNN.com, right? From a computer in the US. It's perfectly okay for a computer in the US to make this request, but someone from North Korea couldn't make this request directly. So from the point of view of B, what B sees is that some message came from um, a, B can decrypt it and knows where to forward it, but B doesn't really know if the original sender was A or if the original sender was Alice. There's certainly no way to track this back to Alice, um, 
right? And also from the point of view of A, even though A gets the message from Alice, it doesn't really know if the message is from Alice or if Alice is a forwarder from somebody else, okay? So it protects the privacy of everybody. Um, the one downside is that you can actually see the clear text um, data here if you control the server, right? So this message could also be sent over SSH, um, but someone observing the server can see what the content of the message is and ultimately who it came for, from. But this node can say, hey, I don't know who this came from. I'm just forwarding it from somebody else. Uh, maybe if these two nodes are in the US, then this node C is not going to get in trouble. Okay, so there's some support for Tor in, uh, for Tor in a, let's say, BitTorrent client. Um, but unfortunately, uh, at least a few years ago, this wasn't very fast. So now I think maybe this could be um, significantly improved to higher throughput. Um, Tor is also used in um, applications um, on it's used to access websites on the darknet. If you are into that sort of thing, um, you can read about it and kind of get access to the internet that isn't, well, it is publicly available, but it is all encrypted. And so um, if you're feeling so inclined, you can explore that and see um, what you can find on the darknet. I personally have never been on it, so um, I don't know, but you can read about it. It's quite interesting, I think. All right, um, the last unstructured peer-to-peer -peer system I wanna tell you guys about is blockchain. And this is a very, very brief introduction to blockchains. I talk much more about them in my distributed systems class. And um, I think this spring, I'll be able to teach a graduate course on blockchains um, or dedicated more to blockchains um, called uh, distributed system implementation. I think that's going to be the title. So if you're interested in taking that course, um, talk to me and do well in this course. All right, so the way blockchains work at a high level, it's a series of um, blocks or these data structures that contain some data. Now, these data could be uh, cryptocurrency transactions, uh, it could be invocations of smart contracts, it could be just arbitrary data that you wanna put onto the blockchain or sign on the blockchain. That doesn't terribly matter, there's tons of different versions of blockchains. Now, what blockchains have in common is that all the blocks are ordered, okay? And um, there's kind of different mechanisms for that, but the one used in Bitcoin, kind of the original one, um, relies on proof of work. And what proof of work does is it takes the fields in the block, so block number, data, previous block hash, I'll talk about that in a second, um, and the nonce, which is just a random number, um, and it tries to hash all these together such that the hash written to block hash is small enough or starts with some number of zeros, okay? If this is a hexadecimal number, starting with some zeros makes that number smaller. So that number has to be small enough. So it could be that when you cache all this, when you hash all this information together, you do not uh, get a small enough number. Then you can try a different nonce and then maybe you get a low enough hash, maybe you don't. So the process of mining is repeatedly hashing this data while trying a different nonce until you kind of end up with randomly with a low enough hash value. Now, this becomes the block hash. The next block, block number one in this case, references the previous block hash in its previous block hash field. Okay, so there's kind of an arrow linking these two together and then linking these two together. Okay, so now the nonce that you need to find includes the data, the block number, the data, and the previous block hash, okay? So by the time you compute a low enough hash here, this nonce or this block altogether is cryptographically tied to the previous block um, because this hash of the previous block is included inside uh, the hash data for the new block. What you get out of that is that if you need to change anything, if you want to hack it, for example, and change the value of a cryptocurrency transfer in this block, you would then need to recompute the hash and then you would need to recompute the new block. And so it becomes very difficult to try to produce an alternative chain while everybody is building on the main chain. Um, if this doesn't make too much sense to you for now, don't uh, worry too much about it. 
we get into this much more deeply in um, my um, graduate courses, but for now this gives you kind of a, a high idea of how this works. Okay, and so the reason this is a peer-to-peer -peer system is that you have different miners who receive a block that has been created and then try to compute the next block by, by basically rehashing new data uh, with another nonce. Okay, so you have a bunch of miners that are trying to close the new block. When one of them does, it distributes that block to other miners who then start working on the following block. Okay? So when miners get a block that someone else has closed, they verify it. Okay, and um, if it checks out, if it's correct, then they start working on the next block. So because all the miners verify it, you effectively have consensus over the state of each block, which means you have consensus over the data field. And now if the data field is a set of monetary transfers or smart contract executions, you basically have a distributed system whose state can advance from one data field to another. For example, if these are cryptocurrency transfer, you're changing the set of accounts with each new block. Okay. Um, I mentioned um, hashing and I mentioned blockchains and it turns out that for those uh, you, for blockchains you actually need um, both um, hash values or, or uh, kind of cryptographic hash, hashing but also for some of them you need the structured peer-to-peer -peer, uh, distributed hash table to kind of keep track of the different of the different miners okay so let's talk about structured peer-to-peers or distributed hash tables a hash function is a cryptographic function such that if a doesn't equal b um, the probability that the hash of A is equal to hash of B is extremely, extremely low. Okay, so it effectively disambiguates, uh, provides kind of an, a, a, a value, a cryptographic value, um, that is a summary of information. So if A and B are like 1 and 2, this isn't very useful because hashes are long, maybe 256 um, bits, right? Um, but these values that are being hashed could be quite large, for example, entire files, right? And then summarizing that as a hash number is quite useful. Okay, so the basic idea that structured peer-to-peer -peer solve is how to find data in a distributed system, um, in a peer-to-peer -peer system. Um, there were some other uh, kind of less uh, efficient ways of finding that where you basically had to send a query to all the nodes in a peer-to-peer -peer system and see who had the data. This was terribly inefficient, led to bottlenecks and basically very poor performance of these systems. So with structured peer-to-peer, -peer, um, structured peer-to-peer -peer systems basically provide a routing structure that makes it easy to find data. All right, so here's how they work. You have the IDs of nodes that participate in the system, right? Maybe their IPs, and you can hash those IPs and put them on a logical ring where the values are from zero to whatever the max hash value is, okay? Likewise, you can take the IDs of data that you wanna store in the system and also perform a hash. So for example, if you wanna store something like this funny cat's picture, you can, uh, have a name such as funny cats and a value which is basically the bytes for for this image and then you can hash funny cats to something and then that something that hash value will also logically fall somewhere on the ring okay now the node that is following this hash in the ring is responsible for storing all the data that hashes to these positions on the ring up until the next node okay so if you want to store Funny cats, you contact this node and then you give it, you ask it to store um, this data. Okay, so let's see how this data then can be found. So we're trying to find some value, which is here on this ring. And let's say we're starting at this node because this is where we are on this ring. So one way to do this is to keep track of some nodes in our vicinity, of some neighbors. Okay. So if my value is 65A1FC and I want to find D46A1C, um, I can look into my routing table and see that this value is actually smaller um, 
or I guess larger in this case, um, then my values, um, then, then the nodes I know of in my routing table. Okay. So to get to this value, I need to forward the query for that object to the furthest node I know. That node will get that query and also forward it further and further and further until you get to some node who doesn't need to forward it all the way into its routing table, but has a node, nodes of nodes that are kind of in, on the either side of this value. And so it forwards the query to the node that is going to be responsible for this. Now this node can return the content of the data to me. Okay, so the problem with this is that it's not terribly efficient. You can see that the, the kind of routing time is still linear um, in terms of how many hops it takes to get to this node. So the magic behind distributed hash tables is to do this routing in um, log of n steps. And the way that is done is each node will maintain pointers to other nodes that are, uh, let's say, you know, um, halfway around the ring, okay, then a quarter way around the ring, then uh, a fourth around the ring, an eighth, etc. Okay, so when a time comes to find this object, I can say, okay, it's not quite halfway around the ring, it is quarter way around the ring, so this is the furthest pointer I know that is still before this object. Okay, so now I do a quarter way around the ring hop, okay, then this node can do an eighth of the way around the ring hop and then so on and so forth until we get to this in log n steps. All right, so DHTs are used to build, um, were used to build a, um, some interesting systems. These systems aren't kind of an operation today just because cloud computing has proved so scalable that um, we can kind of brute force some of these solutions. But as I mentioned, DHTs are coming back uh, in or are used in blockchain systems. All right, so one of the cool systems was to build a distributed web cache. We talked about web caches already um, and deploy it within an organizational network. And so the idea is there is instead of spending the money on a centralized cache, um, data or, or kind of web objects would be cached around the computers um, within within the organizational net an organization's network, for example, on people's laptops. Okay, and so to find the data on those laptops, let's say you wanted some web object, you would send a query for that object. That object has a well-known name. You can compute a hash for it and then use a distributed hash table to find it on someone else's computer to download it. Okay? the downside of that, the upside, I guess, is that you're using uh, storage in an organization that is being unused on people's computers. The downside is that you need to do multiple hops to find that data. Okay, so um, what we have here is um, the size of per node cache size or how much data you can use on other people's computers and the total amount of bandwidth that, being, that is being sent outside of the organization to fetch web content. So without any cache being deployed in this network, you're sending about, I don't know, 103 gigabytes of data outside. This is over some period of time. And with a centralized cache that can store everything, you can send about, I don't know, 97 um, gigabytes of data outside. Okay, so this is kind of the, the space of improvement, meaning if you have full caching, this is how much data you can uh, kind of save by not sending it outside of the organization. And so if you are able to store more and more data on people's computers, the performance of the DHT improves and users are able to find data on each other's computers and eventually this kind of approaches the performance of the centralized web cache. So that is pretty cool. Uh, this works okay in LAN networks where there's low delay between individual nodes in an organization. Um, but doesn't really work very well in wide area networks where latency starts getting much higher and the number of hops in a DHT um, becomes an impediment to good web performance. Another very cool system um, was Ocean Store, um, and the purpose of the system was to store uh, data in a DHT in a way that it can be modified. Right now, if you recall the model for a distributed hash table, the idea there is that you are 
basically putting some file into this, the distributed hash table under some hash, but then if you modify the contents of the file, you can, it becomes a different file, which means it has a different hash or, you know, so, sorry, it becomes a different file, which means it's not clear how you upload it. Do you replace it? Do you, um, what if there are multiple copies? One of them gets updated, one of them doesn't. Um, so the distributed hash tables are good for publishing files, but not for maintaining their changes. So to address this problem, people developed um, Ocean Store. It's implemented as Pond on, uh, on a tapestry distributed hash table. It's a very, very cool system. So what it does is basically you have um, some ID for the file, okay? And then the history of the file has these different virtual IDs, okay? Um, and in it, you have a root block which gets stored somewhere on a distributed hash table, okay? In that root block, you have these other, you have these pointers to other blocks, okay? Which point to other locations on a distributed hash table. And inside it, you have pointers to the actual data, okay? So the file is composed of these data blocks, okay? And you can find the locations of these from these pointers and these kind of aggregate to the overall pointer saying, if you want to get the value of this file, follow this tree structure to get all the different chunks of the file, download them and there's your file, okay? Now, what happens if there's a change to the file, okay? We are moving here and now that main pointer or the main uh, kind of um, um, root version of a file, okay, points to some number of blocks. Now, let's say that only D6 and D7 have changed, which is this, okay? So we can maintain pointers in here to all of D1 through D4, okay? We can still point back to here. And for the next chunk, we point here, and now we can point the first part to D5, but the last two and three parts to these new data chunks, which are published as their own objects on the DHD, okay? So you can keep publishing data on the DHD, not by republishing the file, but by kind of adding these new chunks and then just maintaining a data structure that allows you to, uh, that kind of points you into the, into the keys on the distributed hash table that you need to find to complete a new version of the file. Okay. So very, very cool system for storing data in a distributed way. As far as I know, it's not used anywhere. Um, I had an idea of kind of way back of adapting this to store data on blockchains using the system. Um, there are some uh, kind of downside to doing this, but um, those downsides that existed a couple years ago might not be there. Uh, in the future, so that might be something that becomes an attractive thing to do again. Um, all right, so when deployed in an organizational network, um, this system is a bit slower than a network file system, which is kind of a centralized solution, um, but both of them, of course, are going to be very slow on uh, wide area networks. So it's, I don't know if it's a good alternative to, NSA, to NFS, but uh, it's certainly an interesting one. Okay, so kind of in summary, um, we have unstructured peer-to-peer -peer and structured peer-to-peer -peer and their advantages and disadvantages, okay? So unstructured peer-to-peer -peer is cool because it's self-organizing. Nodes will just kind of connect with each other and figure out some functionality. Um, and that also makes it really resistant to node failure. But there are no guarantees on any sort of performance or behavior. It kind of works... Um, sort of well, it's prone to excessive messaging if there is no um, structure, for example, during searching for particular objects. And structured peer-to-peers are, provide some guarantees, there's some exceptions to this, but they generally will find objects if those exist in, um, in the peer-to-peer -peer system. Um, they can provide you with some time and complexity bounds on, on what these operations will take to complete. Um, and there is low messaging overhead again, log event type um, messaging solutions. But the downside is that maintaining of this distributed hash table can actually take a lot of messaging traffic, which can affect the performance or availability of the system in the short term. Um, and if 
the nodes exist in a highly dynamic environment where nodes come continually in and out of the network, the joining and leaving and recovery will take a lot of messaging that can then impact uh, the performance of the DHD. So if the network is stable and the node membership is stable, the structured peer-to-peers are great. If on the other hand, network is very unstable and nodes come in and out, unstructured peer-to-peer -peer might be better because it doesn't take as much effort to maintain the network structure. All right, and that sums it up. Um, let me know if you have any questions. I think this is a very interesting um, area. And um, just one thing to kind of keep in mind is that the performance of distributed systems, of these peer-to-peer -peer systems, is always going to be um, kind of difficult to, um, to make good. So if you can build a system that is centralized, please do so. You know, buy some cloud services, figure out a kind of uh, economic structure of your system such that you can pay for those cloud services. That's going to make your life a lot, a lot easier. But there are some situations where for whatever reason, a centralized system is either uneconomical or impractical or doesn't scale. And that's when only then you should consider using a peer-to-peer -peer solutions, which is going to be um, a, a much more of a headache, but um, it can actually expand the performance of your system beyond what you can do through uh, cloud computing or centralized servers. All right. Thank you, guys.